In the teens of the 20th century, science, industry, technology, and commerce were reshaping American culture. Women were within grasp of the vote. Temperance forces were starting, starting the country on a vast experiment with prohibition. Troops returning from Europe were unwilling to return to their farms and rapidly expanding cities and suburbs absorbed rural communities. Ford's Model T personalized transportation forever. Air aircraft were becoming familiar sights overhead. Women's hair got shorter and their skirts did too. Popular music was also beginning to shift. White listeners learned blues harmonies for the first time. Phonographs and piano rolls delivered more music to more homes. Language loosened and took on an African-American hue. As the 20s approached, jazz was maturing in New Orleans. Young players like cornetist Joseph Buddy Pet Pettit developed flexible and infectious styles. The younger men recalled the earliest years of jazz in the city when Charles Buddy Bowman led what was then called a ragtime band and entranced the city with his entranced the city with his powerful tone. His ability to swing both fast stomps and slow drag blues and his charisma as a soloist. But the golden standard of music during the years of the First World War was the Oliver Ory Band, which performed both for dancing and as a brass band. It was led by Edward Kid Ory, the first great trumpetist in jazz, and by Joe King Oliver, at that time still largely unchallenged for the cornet crank. Veterans remember how vigor vigorous, inventive, and solid this band was. It was employed many upcoming 1920s jazz stars, Louis Armstrong, Johnny Dobbs, clarinet, and Warren Beatty Dobbs on the drums. The largest landmark of the decade, however, was in 1917, advent of the original Dixieland Jazz Band, a vaudeville touring quintet of white New Orleans. The band opened in Risen Weber's Cafe in New York and cut landmark and best-selling records such as Livery Stable Blues, Tiger Rag, Ostrich Walk, and Bluein' in the Blues before branching out to tour in England and take London by storm. Thus, the Jazz Age was launched by a crew of young white men from the rough Irish Channel district of New Orleans. Blues music had already found its way into the recording studio by the time the original Dixieland jazz band cut their first sides. Prior to the record industry's discovery, there was a niche market for blues and jazz among black buyers, sparked by the success of Mamie Smith's recording of Crazy Blues in 1920. What little black music was recorded was done, so with the white audiences in mind. The first singers to record any of Handy's blues in 1914 were white. In fact, so many other vaudeville singers who became to incorporate the blues, something of a novelty at the time, into their repertoires, including the young star billed as Queen of the Blues, Marion Harris, and even Sophie Tucker. In New York, the most famous of the early black vaudevillians, Burt Williams, was in the 19th year of his recording career when he finally waxed, I'm sorry, I ain't got it. You could have it if I had it, blues, in 1919, followed by two blues in 1920. Another black act, Dan Calder's string band featuring two banjos had recorded St. Louis Blues in 1917 in London where they were entertaining white Britons at clubs and dance halls. They were billed as Ciro's Club Coon Orchestra. Jesus. The guitar would supplement the banjo as blues came to fruition. But even so, the record labels were late in bringing Sylvester Weaver, the first recorded blues guitarist, to the studio in 1923. And later still in rounding up the first generation of great black blues singer guitarists such as Blonde, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Lonnie Johnson, Blind Blake, and Charles Pat Charlie Patton. Seminal figures such as Henry Ragtime Texas Thomas, Frank Stokes and banjoist Gus Cannon, 
and Poppy Charlie Jackson only began to record in, 19, in the 1920s. But their music obviously echoed sounds from the dawn of blues and before. The most extensive recording of early black ballads, pre-blues, and work in game songs was done by Lead Belly at the behest of folklorists John and Alan Lomax. But not until the 1930s and 1940s, such music held little appeal for commercial recording concerns. Even from its emergence, blues was a multifaceted phenomenon, developing both as a grassroots folk music and local community environments, and as a professional entertainment medium on a more commercial level. It also continued to influence and be affected by musicians from other genres, within or outside the African American culture, from jazz and gospel to old time country and pop. The blues first proven stars atop the black show business ladder were the divas who traveled the vaudeville circle cooperated by the theater owners booking association toba founded in memphis in 1909 these included ma rainey sarah martin ida cox and a young bessie smith among others that they were advertised not just as singers but as comedianes underscored the nature of their art. They could turn tears into laughter and survive in the face of adversity. When the doors to the recording industry opened to them in the 1920s, they were already center stage. <laughs> 